Shades Mountain. It is good to be with you at this amazing moment in the history of God's kingdom. My name is Ed Litton, and uh, a week ago tonight, I was getting on the plane in Mobile, Alabama to go to Las Vegas, Nevada. That's what preachers do after a good offering. And I'm actually, your pastor got me into this. I'm just going to tell you right now. He cornered me in an elevator in Orlando, Florida and said, you are heard of New York? And I said, of course I've heard of New York. He goes, God's calling you to New York. And so we helped start planting churches in Brooklyn because of your pastor. And I, I figured, you know, I got off, I said, he, he comes across so wonderful with people, but man, that guy's tough and I need to be more like him. So I took on uh, an invitation to find a city to, uh, to, to get pastors engaged in church planning, and God led me to Las Vegas, Nevada. So I got on the plane in Mobile last Sunday afternoon, and I went through TSA, and everybody who flies knows what this is like now, right? Post 9-11, you go through the doors, you go up there, and I've got pre-check, because I travel a lot, and so I'm, but it's closed on Sunday in Mobile. You know, Mobile Airport, have you ever been there? Anybody ever been there? It's a Cracker Barrel that planes pull up to. And so, and, and, and I'm going through the thing, and, and when I get my bag, my backpack, and I put it on the conveyor belt, it goes in to be scanned. And I notice, because I've done this a lot, I noticed that something was coming up, because the computer starts buzzing and beeping. The woman looking at it takes it out, puts it back in again, and runs it through a second time. Well, it, it sends the same alarm. I mean, this literally happened last week. And it comes through, she motions for a guy, and this gorilla of a human being walked over. He picked up my backpack with both hands. He looked around, he goes, this yours? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Come with me, walk over here. I'm standing there, he takes it, he's got blue gloves on. He says, is there anything in here that can cut me or harm me? No, sir, I don't think so. He unzips the bag. Apparently, there's, those computers are so sophisticated, they actually point a certain port, port, excuse me, part of my backpack that's the danger. He opens it up. He looks inside. He pulls out my iPad. He looks at it, sets it down. Then he pulls out this Bible. He starts thumbing through the pages of my Bible. I mean, literally. It looks like he went through every page just like this. He looks in the front, he looks in the back, then he looks at me. He said, I thought you said there wasn't anything sharp or dangerous in there. I said, well, it is living, it is active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. He said, amen, I said, amen. He said, roll tide, I said, roll tide. <laughs> That's what you say here, amen? Roll tide. If you're, it's war eagle, then you war eagle. I war eagle, I'll go either way, all right? It's an amen in my church. I'm so honored to be here. I truly love your pastor and your church is a model for all of us in reaching the nations with the gospel. I, I don't know about you, but I think I do though. You don't like meetings. Some of you are dreading tomorrow because you got a meeting to go to. Read an article recently on the five reasons people hate meetings at work and at church. First of all, they last too long. Do I hear a roll tide on that one? Okay. Secondly, they don't always, the person leading it doesn't always know what they're doing. Third, they get off track easily. Fourth, leaders lose control of the meetings. Five, seldom does anything get accomplished at a meeting. <laughs> Roll tight. Do you realize Jesus had only one scheduled meeting between his resurrection and his ascension? Just one. Now, he met a lot of people, did a lot of things. But he had one scheduled meeting, and it has and is still changing the world. His meeting didn't last long. He was absolutely in control of every, everything at the meeting. It was a life-transforming meeting, and it has changed our world, and it is still changing our world. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the minutes of the meeting. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. Now, as you're turning there or turning on your computer, your iPhone, your iPad, or whatever, can I tell you something about this meeting? This is going to sound odd in, in light of everything I just said, but this meeting is still going on. As a matter of fact, we're live streaming this meeting. We're live streaming it from the very place it took place, and the very person in charge of the meeting is still live streaming this meeting. Listen to the minutes of the meeting. 
Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. We just worshipped the living God together in some of the most beautiful worship I have ever heard tonight. And it isn't just the quality of the voices or the orchestration or the, or the choir that backs up the singers. It is the heart of God. It is God's heart being resonating with the people that he loves and created and redeemed. It says they worshiped, and look what else it says, but some doubted. I'm there. I'm there. Let me say more about that in just a second. And the scripture then says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the end of the age. Who's present at this meeting? Well, there were the 11, minus the one who hung himself. Uh, Paul will later tell us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were 500 who came total. And so take 11 from 500, you get the idea of the, of the crowd of the followers that were there. But there is another group there, and you're going to be glad to hear this because you are there. But look what the last verse says. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Somebody shut me down here, but this is, this is so powerful. Don't start running through the room. I know you all like to do that at Shades. You fall out and have all kinds of experiences here, but I'm just telling you guys, it gets exciting when you realize what Jesus is saying. I am live streaming to you right now through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And what's happening at the meeting? Well, we've been worshiping him, and yet even in this midst of this wonderful worship, there's some of us who are struggling with doubts. We're struggling with doubts. I, I am struggling with a doubt for my son who has been for the last year and a half in a rehab program, successfully graduated, and almost instantaneously relapsed. I spoke to him on my way to this meeting, and my heart is breaking as he's struggling and he's lost in it. They were worshiping and they were doubting. I don't know what you're doubting right now. I don't know if you're doubting the goodness of God. I don't know if you're doubting the grace of God, the sufficiency of God. I don't know what you're doubting. But when Jesus came off of the most glorious moment his disciples ever witnessed, there were three of them who got to see it firsthand. When they came off the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus said, we must go. They wanted to stay. They wanted to build a Baptist encampment there. They wanted to stay, and Jesus said, no, we gotta go back to the demon-possessed valley. When they got to the valley, he meets a man whose son is demon-possessed, and what does the man say? He says, Jesus said, do you believe I can help you? He said, well, your disciples have not been able to help me. That doesn't shock me or surprise me. He says, but I, I believe you can do something. Would you please help my son? He throws himself into the fire. This demon possesses him. It's unbelievable nightmare. I don't know how we're gonna go on. Jesus said, do you believe? He said, I believe but help my unbelief. Jesus didn't give him a lecture or a booklet. He said, that works, let's do it. So the best place to bring your doubts is right here. You believe that? The best place to bring your doubt is right here to this meeting with the Lord Jesus. And I encourage you, every morning start your day with a meeting like this and bring your doubts and let the powerful, resurrected Jesus Christ deal with your doubts. A meeting with Jesus is the greatest place to go. And I look at the focus of this meeting. We call this the Great Commission. There are actually five commissions in the New Testament. There's one in Matthew, this one. There's the one in Luke. There's one in Mark. There's one in John. And there's one in the book of Acts. But this one's called the Great Commission for a reason. And, and the others are commissions to proclaim the good news everywhere. And so they're valid commissions, they're important commissions, but this one is different because, I think, primarily of one word. It's a Greek word, mathetes. It means to make disciples. So this evening, I'm going to challenge you, first of all, to remember his authority. Verse 18 says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now, I am not an expert on authority, but I, I, I am able to look at this passage and tell you that when someone says they've got all authority, that's pretty encompassing. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. 
We know that the Greek word for authority is exousia. It's different from the Greek word for power, dunamis. And so Jesus said, not only do I have power, dunamis, to raise from the dead, but I have authority to now send you anywhere as my people and and to tell you where to go to plant this gospel and to watch it explode with life. The best way I can describe authority and the difference between authority and power is football, and Alabama's a good place to talk about football, amen? So what's the difference between a power and authority? A young football player has power. He can run down that field at unbelievable speeds. That lineman can hit you and knock you into Thursday. Are you with me? They have power. Compare that player at Auburn or Alabama, since those are the only professional teams we have in our state. <laughs> I'm trying to stir up trouble here. And, and so compare them to the referees. Guys in the striped shirt, the short guys, the overweight guys, you know, the guys who could not run up and down the field if their life depended on it. If you put a gun to their head, now I know they're not all that way. All you had to do is watch the national championship. Are you a ref? Pull a flag on me, man. Anytime you think, if I, if I say something wrong, blow your whistle. But anyway, but he has a whistle and he has a flag. He has not the power of the player. He has the authority of the book of rules. And his purpose is that this game would be run right. And so the difference between power and authority can be seen even in a football game. But when Jesus declares all authority, he is declaring a mouthful. He says, I not only have the authority to send you and to go with you, but I have the power to take you there, keep you there, and send you on to your next place. Satan has power. But when Jesus rose from the dead, good news, He lost his authority. He has no authority over us. What he had was stolen, and the reality is in the garden, God shared with man his authority. Satan deceived man, and man became a multiplying sinner, spreading death and heartache throughout the world. But God's plan was revealed even in the beginning, that through the seed of a woman, she would bear a warrior king who would take back all that had been stolen. He would embrace sin and death and seem to be consumed by it only to destroy it with his mighty power and authority. And Jesus told us now with all authority that our mission is to make disciples. If I asked you to write out a definition of what a disciple is, there's probably not two people in this room who would write the exact same definition. But you don't have to. Jesus gives us one in Mark 1.17. Listen to this. He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Follow me and I will turn you into something. I will make you a fisher of men. I will make you a maker of disciples who make disciples Now we have his authority, and now we have his authority to be on his mission. And if we are on his mission, he has a promise of resources and that even Satan himself will flee from us. Folks, this is a game changer. It was a game changer for my church. When we actually started asking a hard question and listening to the answers, and the question we asked was, are we making disciples? And the more we examine it, the more we realize we probably weren't like we thought we were. You see, we were trusting a certain method or a certain program, and in fact, disciple-making is a highly relational task. There was a death in our high school next door to our church. A young scholar, I mean, he was a very bright young man, was killed in a car accident last year. Uh, They called counselors into the school the next morning, and they called pastors. And I went, along with another pastor in our community, whom I know, and he's a good man, uh, we both went to his honors class, the honors class of this boy where all of his best friends were, and and the teacher, unbeknownst to us, was going to open it up for questions. He said, kids, you got any questions? They're sharp kids, and they had questions. They wanted to know why this happened. Why would God let this happen? The other pastor immediately said, well, I just want to tell you something. In the name of Jesus, Jesus had nothing to do with this accident. Accidents are of the devil. The devil caused this accident. One of the kids in the back looked at me and he says, you believe that? I said, no, I don't. I believe God is sovereign and in control. And the devil only does what 
the Lord God Almighty allows him to do. I was not expecting that uncomfortable confrontation with my fellow pastor of another church in my community. But I want to tell you something. Then I said this. Nine years ago, my wife of 25 years was suddenly taken from me in a car accident. She was killed in an instant. And my life went on a totally different trajectory. I did not want to live. I did not want to go on. I did not want to face life without her. That may be the closest definition I can give you to an idol when you don't think you can live if that thing isn't in your life or that person. But God in his infinite grace and God in his infinite wisdom showed me that he had a different direction for my life and that my job wasn't to figure it out. My job wasn't even to come up with the answers. My job was simply to trust. Several years before that, there was a pastor in Denver, Colorado, building a great church, planting 24 different churches in the state of Colorado. His name was Rick Ferguson. And uh, Rick was killed in a car accident on a Thursday, just like Tammy was. His family was with him. They were in the accident, and his wife survived the accident. Her name was Kathy Ferguson. And God, in his infinite wisdom, brought us together several years ago. And we stand amazed. We stand amazed that God had a plan. And it doesn't take away our sorrow. It doesn't mean... We still don't miss our mates, but we have a person who understands, and we have a mission together, and that mission is to make disciples, and so God called us to this, and we are under his authority, which is, um, the reason I'm telling you my story is because you need to know that there's no promise that when you live sent, that everything's going to work out wonderfully. When you live sent, you're never going to have problems, and you're going to be in the apex and the epicenter of God's joy and glory. He may call you to a hellhole by anyone's definition, but it's where God is getting ready to move and change the world through his glorious gospel. Will you go? Remember, he has authority, and we have to live out that authority. We have to trust in that authority. A seminary student asked me after Tammy died, did your view of God's sovereignty help you or hurt you when Tammy died? I looked at him and I said, yes. It utterly crushed me that God would let me be crushed. And it utterly comforted me that this was not an accident, that God knew before the foundation of the earth and God had appointed this moment. Now, I'm here to tell you something. I'm here to tell you that we need to remember his authority. I had a weird thing, Danny. I don't know what happens when weird things come to your office, but I usually give them to my executive pastor. (laughs) Is your executive pastor here? Because, yeah, he... Yeah, okay. But he's probably out handling, yeah, he's handling weird things, right? Well, this woman and her husband came to see me. They wanted me to do an exorcism. They don't teach you that at Southwestern Seminary. I immediately scanned my memory thinking, not even Southern, I'm working for my doctor, do they have a course? Al Mohler does not teach a course on exorcism. But I believe the word of God and I know someone who has authority. So we sat down with this woman. She's Roman Catholic background from from Central America, and she has a daughter, an abusive marriage. Uh, Years ago, this daughter was born. This daughter was born with severe handicaps and severe problems, but the girl acted in such a way, and she gave me evidence, and I'm telling you, it sounds like something off a movie. This girl was violent and mean and, if not evil, So she went to her priest, and they agreed to do an exorcism. The priest came, and he put holy water on her. He attempted to cast out whatever it was. And and you may say, well, this is just psychological. Well, I probably, but I don't know. And he tried it, and nothing happened. And so she came to me. She came to me. Do you Baptists have anything for me? And the woman was desperate. And I looked at her, and and I, I said, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I prayed. And that's all very, very important. But I said, Lord, tell me what to say to this precious woman, because she's desperate. And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I don't have magic. I I have no magic. I have no holy water. So I'm not going to put you through some ritual, but I'm going to tell you something. I know a man, and his name is Jesus. And he has all authority. And I want to tell you, what you need more than an exorcism is you need Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Shared the gospel with her. She and her husband both gloriously received Christ as her Savior. Then we got on our knees and asked God to do whatever he needed to do to deliver her daughter. 
who's in an institution. The next Sunday, that was like in the middle of the week, that Sunday she comes to church. She is beaming. She walks up to me, runs up to me, and she goes, something's changed in my daughter. Something has changed. She's calm. She's no longer throwing fits of rage. She, he, she has been changed. I'm thinking, whoa. The next Tuesday, our staff eats lunch together. and We walked into a Chipotle in Mobile, walk in, and she's sitting there with the caretaker and her daughter eating calmly. And when we walked in, the woman goes, no, she goes, come here. This is the men I told you about. They told me about Jesus. And the worker looks at us and says, something has changed in this girl. I don't understand all that. and You don't have to debate it, but I'm just here to tell you. I give glory to a God who has all authority. Amen? Are you willing to trust him? That when you live sent, when you live your life in Birmingham sent, when you live your life in this county sent, or wherever God sends you, because he has, some of you, he's sending here to the inner city. Some of you, he's sending to this community. Some of you, he's sending in a support way, in a mechanism that helps keep the gospel moving in Indianapolis and in Tucson and in Las Vegas and around the world. So number one, we need to live like he is risen. We challenged our church this year to pray every day, to get their iPhones or whatever they're using to set alarms and put 1002 down. You may already do this. 1002. It's Luke 102, which is a time to pray, Luke 102. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might thrust laborers into the field. And so when that alarm goes off, and it'll go off in the middle of my sermon during that second service, and, and we are reminded to stop, drop, and pray right then. For the Lord of the harvest. By the way, it's the most amazing prayer when you think about it. It's the most descriptive Jesus ever got in telling us what to pray for. He said, pray for this because what happens is the prayer, the prayer that's prayed by the person becomes answered when that person prays the prayer and then goes. You see, God called you to pray to the Lord of the harvest and, and you are really the answer to your own prayer. So, number one, we are to remember his authority. Number two, verse 19 tells us we are to act on his imperative. What is his imperative? He says, go make disciples. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We've often heard this said in our preaching that the phrase there means as you go, it does. The problem is, is how you and I as Americans and English speakers interpret the phrase, as you go. We interpret it in a passive tone. It, 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 as you go, if, if you get a chance, as you're making money and making your dream come true, if you have an opportunity, share the gospel. As you go, but that's not really, just think about the word go for a second. I've looked it up in Hebrew, I've looked it up in Greek. I've researched it in Aramaic and Syriac and Farsi, and guess what go means? Go. Go. But it's interesting, as you go is a participle phrase. Now, I'm not the kind of guy that throws this kind of stuff around, because I, I pastor rednecks. I'm a missionary to rednecks in South Alabama. So they're not impressed when I throw out Greek words, but I thought maybe you people were a little more sophisticated. So as you go is a participle phrase. It's an aorist participle phrase. This is going somewhere. But it is followed by an aorist imperative, mathetes, make disciples. So when you have an aorist imperative that is preceded by an aorist participle phrase, as you go, you will say, well, does it happen anyplace else in the Bible? It does. The angel of the Lord appears to Joseph, the stepfather of our Savior, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, and they're living now in Bethlehem, and Herod is sending soldiers. You can almost hear them stomping on the road on the way to Bethlehem to kill all the infant boys in that city, and the angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph and says, get up, take this child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. The concern of Jesus at this meeting that he's live streaming here at Shades Mountain is that we get busy making disciples who will make disciples under the authority of Jesus Christ. I don't know what happened, but in the southern culture, 
We have allowed our people to think that they can call themselves a Christian without being a disciple of Jesus. There's something wrong with that. You say, explain, I don't understand. We can call ourselves Christians in the South. You share with the gospel with almost anyone here, and they say, oh, I've heard that. Uh, the average, get this, we, we discovered this statistic, the average unchurched person in Mobile, Alabama has 10 years of church experience. And I can just about tell you why they don't go anymore. And it's not just Mardi Gras, it's not just like they could smoke a little weed, it's because they've been hurt or they've been pushed out or they weren't challenged or they got off on some foolishness and they just said, this isn't worth it anymore. Or the devil knows how to sidetrack any of us, but the reality is, God has called us to make disciples who make disciples. We are under command, we are under his authority. And, and mere claims of possessing dunamis or exousia Power or authority apart from Jesus Christ and apart from the mission of making disciples are false claims. What is discipleship? It is the transfer of the revealed truth that transforms our worldview and changes real world behavior. I'll say that again. It is the transfer of revealed truth that transforms my worldview and changes my real world behavior. I begin to love people whose skin may be a very different tone than mine. I begin to care about the least of these. And when I find a guy beaten and left for dead on the side of the road, I don't look the other way and walk the other way. But I get down off my donkey and I get down and pour oil and wine all over his wounds. And I bind up the wounds. I don't do the healing. The oil and the wine does the healing. Interesting that they were both sacramentally used. It is amazing what God has called us to do. And it's our mission to get up and do it, to live our lives sent for the glory of God. Our story, your pastor asked me a moment ago just to briefly talk about it. After Tammy's death, everything in my life seemed to change. And I have an amazing, loving congregation that loved me through some very painful hours and days and years. They're very patient people. Somebody said, what's the secret to longevity? Find patient people. They've tolerated a lot of different things from me, but, but we sincerely started asking, are we making disciples? And we realized something. Discipleship is not a program. Jesus showed us discipleship is very relational. You will not go to the ends of the, wor- ends of the world or the ends of the earth and avoid having relationships with people. You can't do it. And guess what? Can I tell you something? People, lost people, even saved people, are messy. Amen? They are messy. Their lives are messy, and they don't know where the books of the Bible are. They don't know how life is supposed to be done, and their lives are often so entangled. You think, this this is going to take forever, but I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God will transform their lives, but they need relationship with you to help them navigate those changes. They need intentionality. So we started getting intentional about leading and training leaders to be intentional disciple makers. And they need integration. They need people who will lead them into the places they were told to avoid. Places where real lostness exists in our community and real starvation is in this community and real poverty in this community and where real racial confusion and hatred and sexual orientation and gender confusion are. They, disciple makers go into these places. Today we have part-time Christians and Jesus is looking for full-time disciples. Disciples who make all of their life about being on mission. And he says very plainly here what we're supposed to do. He says, I want you to go. I want you to go. We have 17 international mission trips this year planned in our church, and I looked at the list of yours. You're amazing. This is amazing stuff. One woman on my staff and has been a member of our church for many years before she began serving as an administrative assistant on our staff, but she just got back from Tanzania. First time she'd been to Africa. She'd been to Brazil. She'd been to a lot of different places, but she came back, and her testimony just brought tears to our eyes and staff meeting. She said, Pastor, I got down there, and there were these kids everywhere, but none of them wanted anything to do with me because I'm so white and I'm so blonde. They were afraid of me, so I was hoping some kid would warm up. She goes, out of the blue, this one little kid runs and dives into my arms, and he sat on my lap, and she goes, when I sat him down on my lap, the smell of this child just wafted up my nostrils. He said, she said, I got sick. 
at my stomach. I had to turn away. I had to think, this is the worst smell. And she goes, as soon as I thought that, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, said, Tammy, this is how you smell when you run into my arms. And she said, I couldn't do anything but embrace him and love him. And, and, and I'm, I'm just telling you, when you live your life on mission, you go. And then you baptize. What does that mean? Well, you know physically what it means, but it also means to trinitize them. We teach them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We teach them that God is a God of all people. Now, there aren't black Christians and white Christians and Asian Christians. There aren't Republican and Democratic Christians. Joshua chapter 5, Joshua meets the, the, the captain of the host of the Lord. Remember? He meets him. He says, whose side are you on? Theirs or ours? He said, I'm not on sides. I'm here to take over. We live in the most divisive time I've ever seen in my lifetime in America. We can divide over everything. And I just have to take every opinion I've got about politics. And I have to command it to shut up and sit down, my master has called me to make disciples. And that mess does not help me make disciples. I have strong opinions, and I'm a, I am a patriotic American, but I am secondarily an American. I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of the living God. And I love my country, and I pray for my country. I serve my country. I do everything I can for my country, but I'm going to tell you something under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and then we are to teach them all things. Teach them. Teaching has become, it became odd at our church. It became a lecture. And we changed our discipleship approach by creating circles and not rows. And we made, we encouraged people, we sometimes forced them to sit in circles, look at each other, and open up and get real about what the scripture was saying to them. And, and, and then ultimately, instead of sitting and souring and soaking week after week in my preaching or in a Bible study, we're also through these small groups calling them into the prisons and orphanages and the inner city to shelters and rehabs and places of work and school and play to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I was in college and seminary, there was a thing I could never quite understand. Somebody said, what's the hardest class you took in seminary? It was seminary. <laughs> And I want you to know I had to work hard at every class. It didn't seem like anything came easy. And I want you to know I'm proud of every C I got in seminary. But every once in a while, there'd be this guy who was auditing the course. What's that? Now, some of you can come up and explain it to me later. You've done it maybe. But they would audit the course. They would, I guess, pay a, a smaller fee than I had to pay. And they would sit there, take notes if they wanted to. Don't take notes. Or maybe they were just interested in the subject, but they didn't take any exams. They didn't have to write any papers. And, and when it was at the end of the, they, they skipped finals week. They're just auditing the course. I hated those guys. I had to work for it. And I'm asking you, are you auditing Christianity? Are you just taking notes and putting them in a Bible someplace? Is it making no real eternal difference? Are you not obeying what the word of God says to do? Are you just auditing? And when a test comes, you whine and say, why are you testing me like this, oh God? I promise you, God will, is not cruel. Though at times you'll be tempted to think he is. But he is a God who leads you through the valley of the shadow for a reason. That you might know him. I'll never forget the day when I entered the valley of the shadow of death. I asked the Lord, I asked him, I flat out, I said, I got a question. And when you suffered, you tend to think you deserve an answer. I said, I have a question. I want to know, how long is this going to take? Nothing. He gave me no answer. He gave me no answer. Because there is no answer to that question. Can I tell you? Within a year or two, I was in that valley still, but I was singing a different tune. I said, Lord, don't ever take me out of here because you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. Folks, we have a very brief moment in this, this existence as human beings. What will you do for the glory of God? What will you do to live 
sent. What will you do tonight? How will you respond to this message? Verse 20 tells us the third thing of the message, and that is trust his promise. Trust his promise. Trust him. You haven't trusted him too much. You can't trust him too much. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will surely be with you always to the very end of the age. It's the Greek phrase, ego I'm me. I became fascinated by it. Ego I'm me. Literally, I am the very I am God with you. That's literally what it says. I, even I, will be with you to the very end of the age. You see, when Jesus called this meeting, he alone was able to pull this off. He alone would say to everyone who lives sent, I will go with you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I will walk with you through every trial, every false allegation, every misunderstanding, every strife-filled moment with other Christians, working out the grace of God in your mission, what every, every need you have, every want and desire you have, every pleading prayer, oh God, would you wake these people up? The gospel moves slowly, it seems, but it moves Because he has a purpose in this meeting, and you are a vital part of that purpose. This is a call. This is a call of God to transfer discipleship from one generation to the next. You asked me about Redemption Church. Actually, it was not about changing our name. The least interesting part of the story was the name change. And when it finally happened, it just happened so effortlessly. It was amazing. I wouldn't write a book about it because I I don't think we can replicate this. But we started with the right questions. Are we making disciples? The next question is I sat down with everyone in my church, 50 and older. (laughs) We had a meeting. had cheesecake, and so they showed up, and we had coffee. I just turned 50, so we got together. Hey, isn't it fun? AARP, you know, we were having a good time. (laughs) It was a pretty good crowd of people. It was probably about this size of people. And we we sat down, and I said, all right, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm just going to be honest with you. You are the backbone of this church. I love you, but that is not good enough. You're going to die. It was like some of the people had never thought about that. I said, every one of us have an expiration date. It may or may not be tattooed, but it's coming. Some of us sooner than more than the others. And I said, we have not as a church reached the next generation. We're going to have to do that. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me in any changes I make. They're going to be based in the truth of God's word, and I make this promise to you. They will be for the purpose of reaching the next generation. And lo and behold, they said, yeah, let's do it. Blew me away. I mean, I'm not everybody smiling as they go out the door, but I'm telling you, when I made that challenge to my 50 and older crowd, the average age of First Baptist North Mobile was 37. That's not bad. Today, the average age is 27 because they did what I asked. What God's asking you tonight is to let his redemptive plan play out in your life, through your life. Think about all the possibilities of what it means to live sent and just surrender. Don't ask God to explain everything to you in advance. Just say, I was at this meeting And the Lord clearly said, I have all authority in heaven and earth, now go. And it was my job not to question or say, what should I do, where should I go? I'm just going to trust you. So, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. You can count on me. I'm here. I'm here. Planted a church in Tucson, Arizona. Brian Hook is here, and Brian's planting a church in Tucson. Brian, Brian's dad was my youth pastor when I was a teenager in Tucson. He was just a snotty little kid running around then. But but it was, I'm so proud of Brian. I love him. I think of Ralph Canada sitting over here. We were in Cuba together recently. But when I planted a church in Tucson, um, a lot of strange things happened, glorious things happened. But I'm going to tell you this story and I close. A man in our church, a man who helped us to come plant the church, had been a biker at one time. His name was Dan Murdoch, and he had gotten saved. And he was a rough, tough man. I mean, he was awesome and big guy. He Before security teams, I always felt secure around Dan. And sure enough, Hal Cron was another biker in a gang called the Huns. Nice boys. 
Hal told me he could have my mother killed for 25 bucks. I said, do you have a card? We can talk. But I said, I love my mother. But you never know. And <laughs> Hal had been witnessed with the gospel by Dan 10 years ago. And when he got back to Tucson, he looked Dan up because he was ready to give his life to Christ. It wasn't my preaching. But that Sunday, I'll never forget it, I watched this really rough-looking biker get off a Harley hog in the parking lot, make his way inside. He finds Dan. They hug each other. And while I'm preaching the gospel, Dan's leading him to Christ in the foyer of the church. I'm seeing it. It's like watching something on television while I'm preaching. And so... At the invitation time, Dan brings him down to the altar and he gets on his knees and surrenders his life to God. One of the worst things you can do in the subculture of a biker world is to give your life to Jesus Christ because it makes you an instant outcast. His wife, that's what we call her, he called her his old lady. Her name was Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia leaves Hal and goes to live with his best friend. His name is Dago to publicly shame her husband for being such a weakling to give his life to Christ. So now we know the drama is heating up and something's about to happen. I would walk with Hal through that terrible experience. I would bring the word of God into his life. We would pray together. I was coaching him and counseling him. I would spend hours on the phone late at night when he's struggling with going back to his addiction or going back to the biker world, and then he would come through. I know my Redeemer liveth, and it was a tough, tough time, but he grew and he grew and he grew. His greatest prayer request was that Cynthia would get saved. By the way, we would use him because of his beard and how he leaves a Handsome man, and, and uh, I don't know what he is today, but those days he was handsome. He looked like you would think Jesus looked like, so we put him in our, our Easter musical. We nailed him to the cross. It was awesome to have this virile man's man be nailed to the cross, and he acted perfectly. Then he pleaded with me, don't ever ask me to do that again. I said, well, did we actually drive the nails through? He said, no, no. But kids are walking up to me every Sunday and just touching me. And saying, Jesus, he said, I'm nothing like Jesus. I said, oh, Hal, you've come so far. You're more like Jesus now than you were. He ran into Cynthia one day. You think there are accidents in this world? And she was sober, and he had the opportunity in the front cab of his pickup to share the gospel with her. And Cynthia prayed and asked Christ into her heart. What an answer to prayer. They didn't talk about all the details of how she would leave that life and all, but they just thought, we'll keep talking, and I'm here. I want you to know I love you. I want our marriage restored. She got out of the truck. She got in her car. She went home. The next night, Dago murdered her, murdered her. He was drunk. He shot her when she told him he was going to leave him. He was sentenced to prison in the prison system in Arizona. The Huns are everywhere. So they had to put him in isolation and solitary confinement for the rest of his life. And nobody in his family ever talked to him. Nobody in the Huns had anything to do with him. He's sitting in a cell all by himself when one day a guy gets clearance to go into that cell, and his name was Hal. And Hal told his old friend about Jesus. And Hal forgave him. And how led him to Christ and then discovered he did not know how to read. And so every week he would go in with a Bible and he would teach Dago to read with the word of God. I don't know that you can sterilize disciple making. It is messy, but it is powerful and world changing. Will you at this meeting do what they did at that meeting when this meeting began? Will you let Jesus live stream to you right now? For he is calling you to live your life sent. At the ends of each of these pews, there's a stack of cards. Would you take one of those and pass it down? And as it's passing down, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to listen carefully to my instructions for the next moment or so. There is an opportunity tonight for you to commit to surrender without knowing, but just willing to go to full-time mission service. Uh, This isn't something that probably just sprung on you, but 
the Lord could do that. But it's probably something you have been thinking about, praying about, maybe running from. But tonight is God's way of saying, listen, I'm international. You can't run from me. I don't want you to run from me. I want you to go with me. Full-time mission service. Secondly, short-term mission service. You can see the back at all of these incredible mission opportunities your church provides. And so you can check that second box or community engagement. Whatever you do, especially if you go on a short term, if you're willing to go around the globe to touch the face of a black child or a brown child and to help somebody, then why don't we do that here in Birmingham? God's called us to engage with the gospel, to live our life sent. Here's the fourth box, helping others go on mission projects. This is so important. You are the lifeline of the gospel. When you help people, do not minimize that. Your name is Barnabas. You need to pray for missionaries. Pray believing. Call down God's power on nations and tribes and tongues. Share Jesus with someone in my sphere of influence, and maybe you would be bold enough to put their name on there, someone you're concerned about but maybe fearful to talk to. And then the, the last box is, I have previously made a commitment to mission service, and I am reaffirming this commitment right now. And then fill out the rest of this, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to have a moment of invitation to come and to surrender these cards to the Lord who called this meeting, to put them on this altar, to give them to God. Say, Lord, I don't know what next year's going to be like in 2017. I don't know what this year will be like, but I'm going to commit myself, surrender myself to you and all your authority that no matter what happens, you are in control, and I put my trust in you. I'm going to pray. Would you stand together with me right now? Lord, as we stand in your holy presence, as we make our way in just a moment to this altar to surrender our lives as sent people, we're so grateful for the blessing of God to gather us together, but every time we gather, it's so that we will be sent again. Let us not grow weary of this. Let us realize the importance of this. Very few people in this room have not heard this passage before. But Lord, we come to you and we surrender afresh to your all authority in heaven and earth. And we respond to the crying, the cry of the holy seraphs who sing holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty and the voice of the one who asked, and whom shall we send and who will go for us? And the cry of my heart is, here am I, send me. And may you be glorified and Satan be horrified at what God is doing with his sent people. It is in Jesus' name we go. Amen.